the liquidity provider token might be deemed a uh, security under Japanese laws. And if it's deemed a security, then the deposit of the funds is not considered uh, a deposit and there's no custody, uh, custody service on behalf of the liquidity provider, but it's considered an investment. So um, I, I would say the proper way to start is uh, to classify the liquidity provider token. We, we have talked about the difference between centralized exchanges and decentralized exchanges in the past video. Um, now, could you explain how AMM, automatic market maker, categorized? Actually, if you take a look at AMMs, um, I, I would say the setup is quite simple, but it's a bit more complicated from a regulatory point of view. I think and most people think that um, AMMs are some kind of decentralized exchange. Um, the difference between the decentralized exchange we talked about last time and AMMs is that they don't have an order book. So people who want to swap tokens on AMM, they are not interacting with other traders. Um, they're interacting with a smart contract and uh, liquidity pools. If you take a look at um, order book DEXs, um, what you will see is um, that there are many bits and asks, right? So you can see uh, them on both sides of the screen. So it's yeah. uh, red and, and green. But for an um, AMM, you don't have this kind of order matching. It's actually what it, an order book DEX is doing. It's matching uh, bits and asks, right? So if, if there's a match, um, the order is executed and filled. Mm. Um, on an AMM, there's no need to find a counterparty for your trade because the counterparty is becoming the smart contract or the, uh, the liquidity pool. So you mm -hmm. always, you will always be able to, to sell and buy tokens or swap tokens on AMM. Um, the price is just uh, one of the issues you, you have to consider. But is it still an ex a crypto exchange activity that is supposed to be regulated in Japan? Right. So um, if you take a look at the regulations again, uh, you will see that intermediary services for the exchange of crypto assets are regulated. And uh, since you are able to swap uh, different kinds of tokens, which are usually classified as crypto assets, um, it's a regulated activity. That's, that's correct. So in so far, they're not different from uh, other taxes. So, so, so just to, to, to make sure, they are, they are not using uh, order book, but they are engaging with... Um, another kind of uh, crypto exchange activity. Right, it's still um, a, an intermediary service for the exchange of crypto assets, but it's just no order matching between uh, two participants on, on the exchange. So it's really just uh, the user using the smart contract functionality and there's no con uh, counterparty to, to his trade. So if you take a look at um, AMMs, uh, you will see that there are liquidity pools uh, where liquidity providers uh, usually provide at least one pair of tokens. Uh, so let's use uh, wrapped ETH and uh, DAI, for example. The point where you have to ask yourself whether there's a custody service, um, it's actually on the liquidity provider side because they are providing the liquidity, they are uh, depositing their funds into the smart contract. Um, the problem here is, um, well, actually, the challenge is um, that the smart contract issues a liquidity provider token. And uh, the liquidity provider token might be deemed a uh, security under Japanese laws. And if it's deemed a security, then the deposit of the funds is not considered uh, a deposit and there's no custody, uh, custody service on behalf of the liquidity provider, but it's considered an investment. So um, I, I would say the proper way to start is uh, to classify the liquidity provider token see whether it's security. And if it's a security, there's a high chance that the uh, provision of funds to the smart contract is not a deposit of funds, which uh, might be subject to crypto regulations, but an investment into uh, the protocol. DAI and ETH in the pool, they are still crypto assets, but the liquidity provider token you receive in return, uh, this might be considered a security. Liquidity provider token you're talking about, is, is, it, is it different from um, governance token? Uh, it is different. So the liquidity provider token represents uh, the share of the liquidity provider in the respective pool. So if you're providing DAI and ETH to the pool, um, then your liquidity provider token is representing your share of DAI and ETH in the pool. And uh, based on your share, you're participating in the transaction fees which are charged to the user for interacting with the pool. What, what you're thinking about is the staking of liquidity provider token where you can earn governance tokens. The, the reason why many liquidity providers provide liquidity to the pools is um, participating in the transaction fees. 
um, but also to earn governance tokens in, in the pool by staking their liquidity provided tokens. So it's different from the Ether token pair, but it represents the, the rights that you have those token pairs. Correct. Hmm. So actually, if you want to have your money back at some point, you have to transfer your liquidity provided token to the uh, smart contract, and then you can redeem your, your DAI and ETH in this case. And, and that liquidity provider token has to be assessed fast. Right. So from our point of view, you, you uh, start with the analysis of uh, this token first. Uh, so you, you assess whether it's a security or not. And um, if it's a security, um, then it has some implications for the rest of the analysis. What if it is assessed as a security then? So actually, we, we think that uh, there's a high, high chance that most of the liquidity provided tokens will be uh, considered a security. Actually, uh, th there might be more than one regulated service which they're providing. So last time we took a look at custody services and we took a look at the crypto or intermediary service right, for the yeah. of crypto assets. So even if there's no custody, uh, they're still subject to regulation True. or there's, there's some regulated activity because they're providing some exchange services. In the case of investment, uh, is there anything additionally we have to be careful? So actually it's a problem because um, mm. then you are not subject only to the Payment Service Act, but you are also subject to the Financial Instrument and Exchange Act. So two laws apply at the same time because you are providing security services and you're providing crypto asset exchange service. Um, it's a bit difficult to comply with both of them. Um, it's hard to comply with one of them already. Uh, but, but it might be much more difficult to, to comply with both of them. Um, so the three-step approach applies to both of them. So first of all, you analyze whether it's a regulated uh, instrument or not. Uh, then you, you see whether it's a regulated activity. And then the third step, you analyze whether there's a person behind it, which could be subject to regulation. So um, this approach is the same for the Payment Services Act and the Financial Instrument and Exchange Act. Cointelegraph. Like, subscribe, and hodl.